So thank you everybody for tuning in today. On today's episode, I have Will Matthews, the founder and CEO of Fellow. Will went from a Playboy executive to founding the largest semen analysis lab in the US. Fellow is a pioneering, a better patient experience so men can find out their sperm count. They can freeze their sperm all from the comfort of their own home without having these extremely awkward doctor visits where you get handed a cup and get told to go watch some videos or read a magazine and deliver the goods all back within 30 minutes to the front desk. You men know what I'm talking about that have been through this experience. It's super awkward and Will is about to make these guys' life significantly easier. We use Fellow at Victory Men's Health and have had a great experience, so I thought he was a perfect guest for the show, uh, and he can fill us in on what he's doing with Fellow. So thank you for being on the show, Will. Awesome. Thanks so much, Amy. Really, <laughs> really appreciate being here. Top of mind here, the thing that everybody wants to know, did you swim in the grotto of the Playboy Mansion? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a great first question. Um, did I swim in the grotto of the Playboy Mansion? I... I uh, I have swam in the Grotto of the Paper Mansion, but I had I had I, I um, had one occasion once upon a time, and it was it was a, a quick. I think it was during the middle of the day, and yeah, it was it was it was definitely definitely one of those uh, like wow, what am, this is this is wild that I'm here. <laughs> well, I knew the men would not be able to focus if I did not uh, ask that question, so we just had to get it out of the way there. <laughs> okay, so. Sure. What, what, one thing about the grotto that was interesting, they, there was a little tunnel that connected the grotto to the swimming pool, so you could swim underwater through the, through the pool, and that was probably the highlight of my, my experience in that. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine just a day at work, you said mid-afternoon, and you're like, oh, let's go swim in the grotto. It must have been a special occasion. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, so you had, I think I read that you went to Stanford. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. You yes, had some time at Playboy, and then you spent some mm -hmm. time at another company um, called Hearth. They were uh, yes. different industries, and now you're in the health space. So where along mm -hmm. this journey did you come up with the idea to start Fellow? So after, um, after Playboy, I joined a former classmate to build a home improvement financing company. And throughout that experience, I was the first full-time employee. I ran operations and was responsible for the company's healthcare plan. Um, I thought I'd built out something wonderful for the team until I wanted to learn how I could use it for my own reproductive health needs, my own uh, urology concerns. I had something that I wanted to get to know the answer answer from from a, a a physician, and I had to go to see my primary care physician. I had to choose a primary care physician first. Um, I had to wait a couple of weeks, and then the physician says, "Go to the fifth floor. You should see the see a urologist." I was expecting for my appointment to continue, and I get there, and the front desk staff say the the earliest appointment is three months from now, and they wait a second. I really want to answer this question. Is there anything that I can do? Are there any earlier appointments? They managed to squeeze me in a little bit earlier than that. And the during the appointment, the physician said, okay, provide this, uh, go to take this specimen container, go provide a sample in the bathroom, come back. And I was expecting for my appointment to continue. And, and the, the physician said, okay, we'll go over your results at the next appointment. And I was like, wait a second. Like, I wish I had done this test earlier and had come in empowered with the information for this physician to be able to provide insight based on what we collectively knew. And it's like, why does why do I need to go to the bathroom for this? Why can't an at-home mail-in test exist, especially as we think about male fertility? I'd seen a, yeah. a couple of women's fertility companies crop up at the time. It's like, why are there no male fertility companies? And the rest is history, so to speak. Yeah, and that visit for men is super awkward. I mean, I have friends or we have patients that talk about it. They're like, man, could it get any more awkward uh, than that experience? So the fact that you have this technology now and that you're able to do it from home is just, it's absolutely incredible. And the guys everywhere should be thanking you because you really are making their life easier. But I imagine along the way as starting any business and especially in a healthcare space and, and a laboratory testing that you had to have some challenges along the way. So, I mean, we don't have to go through them all, but like what was probably one of your <laughs> biggest obstacles that you had to overcome here when, okay, this sounds like a good idea, but now what? So in, in the beginning, we had to raise capital in order to help build out this product and identify what made the most sense to support 
the patients that we were going after. And in the beginning, there was initial pitches and first meeting was a no, second meeting was a no, third meeting was a no, but you just have to keep on persevering. And over the course of a couple of months, we'd really honed in on the value add that we felt we could provide to patients with our at-home mail and semen analysis and investors felt sufficiently compelled to put in capital. And so then we, we raised an initial, I think we raised $400,000 in the, the earliest days of the business. And we used that to get some initial proof points by working with some wonderful directors of Maori Productive Health across the country. Uh, Jim Smith, the director of Maori Productive Health at UCSF, came on board as an advisor. And we learned, okay, this is a real pain point that we can help solve. And that created this uh, this this it's a slow domino where we could use the milestones to demonstrate patient that we were able to support patients to raise the next uh, follow on capital to eventually have our lab today. And, and I think we hit a record. We had a record yesterday with with uh, with 300 and I think 340 samples that came in yesterday. Oh, awesome. That's nice. So you're yeah. so you're marketing direct to consumer. You have clinics like us and urologists and primary care. Mm-hmm maybe not primary care, but urologists, clinics like ours using it. And then am I missing one? Who so else? Would... Our main focus is on empowering physicians with incredible consumerized patient experiences. Okay. It's a, it's a healthcare conference, uh, JP Morgan happening in San Francisco at the moment. I was hearing from a talk uh, from the CEO of Cleveland Clinic yesterday that they are beginning to talk about their patients and refer to them as consumers because we are, we're ultimately all consumers. Yeah. And so our goal is to follow that trend and to, to yeah, empower physicians with incredible consumerized patient experiences. And we do that through a field sales team that supports uh, clinics like, uh, like, like, like yourself and, and others around the country with, a, with, a, uh, with our, our, our biggest focus in uh, urology at the moment. We have a small direct-to-consumer channel that we sell kids to, but our biggest focus is in supporting urology at the moment. But you are right. The landscape of healthcare is changing. It it needs to change, mm-hmm. frankly, but patients are starting to be empowered to take it into their own hands. They can go, they can do more telehealth visits. They can order labs mm-hmm. online. They can order tests like yourselves online. So, I mean, it's really, uh, I think, a positive change and it's great what you're doing. So uh, like you said, we had a field representative stop by and educate mm-hmm. on the test to us. And that's when we started carrying it. And so we, we have kits in the office. So when patients awesome. come to come to us and they're curious about their fertility, either uh, before they start treatment or if they're young before they start on testosterone or, or maybe they get into a new relationship and are now curious what their sperm count is. And we introduce something called HCG if a man, a man wants to stay on testosterone um, and maintain their fertility. So this is a great tool to be able to, to check that um, along the way. So maybe can you talk about a little bit about the process on how, how it works and then what happens when it gets to you guys? Oh, absolutely. So we have we have three products at the moment. We have an at-home mail-in semen analysis, an at-home mail-in vasectomy test to check the success of a vasectomy, an at-home mail-in cryopreservation that can also be done using the full semen analysis kit. I love that. I, I, I appreciate it. And we, we, we stock kits in clinics so that they can provide them to their patients right at that, that point of care, right, right at that point of care moment. And clinic kits are activated in the clinic. So the patient just scans a little QR code, activates the kit. And at that point, we know that that kit is in the hands of that patient. The patient can take the kit home. They have to abstain for a couple of days, so they can't, they can't generate a sample. Um, and then they provide a sample into the specimen container. They add our little preservation solution. It's about five milliliters. They take it to a nearby UPS and we get it at the lab next day, if not the following day. When we receive these samples in our labs, like yesterday, for example, we, and today, um, we, we, we sort through the kits, so all the vasectomy kits, all the fertility kits, the, the full semen analysis, all the cryo kits. We prioritize the cryo and the fertility kits first because we want to make sure that we can measure the motility as accurately as possible. What uniquely makes Fellow Fellow is that we've been able to validate uh, in-house how a semen sample degrades over time so that when we receive it at at, at our lab, 
up to 52 hours, we can accurately predict what the sample was like when it was first generated. And that is to say that if a sample starts with 100,000 moving cells, they'll, they'll slowly deteriorate over time. And so when we get the sample, we can accurately predict that, okay, that was likely around 100,000 moving cells when, when that sample was fresh and first provided. Um, and so we run those tests um, at our lab, and then we release the results to patients. And so our typical turnaround time for results is about, I think we're, we're averaging 12 hours from when we receive the sample at our lab. Oh, wow. That's a quick turnaround time. Can you explain the result page? Because I think you guys do a really good job with the result page for the consumer to be able to read it and not have to come uh, from a physician. Mm -hmm. So that was very important for us in the earliest days of the business when we were building these, building these results. And so we brought on a team from some of our earliest team members, George uh, Mikopoulos and Susan Furist. They joined us from 23andMe. And oh. 23andMe is a company that's built wonderful consumer consumer experiences. And they came on board and worked hand in hand with Jim Smith, the, the director of Maori Product, that was easy to understand, was factually correct, provided the resources that patients need, depending on the outcomes. Let's say a patient is super fertile or sub fertile. We didn't want to leave a patient hanging so that they all of a sudden they learn that, let's say a patient is sub fertile in the semen analysis that we've measured. We don't want them to ask a question, well, now what? And so we really invested in figuring out what experience would be helpful depending on a range of different conditions. And today we have, I think we have, uh, our engineering team will correct me on this, but I think we have um, 10 to 15 different patient reports that are automatically generated depending on okay. how the sample looks at our lab. So now if you would have had this technology when you first went to the urologist, you could have bypass the weight and you could have come in with your results. It was part of the pain point yeah. that you had, right? Like, uh, you know, if a patient um, needs to see a specialist, now they already have the results. They're kind of one step ahead uh, that they can take in for the consultation so they can have a, actually have a consult versus, you know, additional testing before you can come back again in three months to actually speak with somebody about, about your concerns. Um, exactly. And then, and then to the point of the vasectomy test that you have, I hear all sorts of wild stories about guys not mm -hmm. going back and getting that, that second test like they're supposed to. So what's the difference between that, the vasectomy test and just the normal semen analysis test? Mm -hmm. So the full semen analysis, we are concerned about five uh, metrics that, that uh, encompass the semen analysis. So volume, count, concentration, morphology, and motility. So motility is the movement of the cells. Morphology is the shape of these cells. Volume is uh, how much how much volume is there, uh, how much liquid is there. Um, concentration is what is the how many sperm per milliliter, and um, and the the count is just a, how many total cells are in the sample, and so that's what we are focused on providing patients and physicians. Those are the five metrics for a vasectomy test. What we're looking to do is validate that the uh, procedure was successful, and so compliance rates are. Uh, what we have found, they're, they're very low today, and that's something that we have addressed. So when a patient typically has a vasectomy, we've seen 20% um, compliance rates. And what I mean by compliance rates is patients actually going out and testing and learning that the vasectomy was successful. Yeah. And so what we have built is a different product that it ensures very high compliance. So we reach out to patients with automated messages saying, hey, now's the time to test or it's been about 12 weeks. Now it's time to provide a sample, send it back. And so we these notifications have been really helpful to increase our compliance to about, I think we're seeing 85% or so. And so that has been really helpful for a urologist, uh, someone providing a, someone performing a vasectomy to have the confidence that their procedure was, was, was a success. Yeah. And so that compliance rate is really, really important. And then given that there are so few cells, if any, we're not as concerned about the movement of these cells as we are how many are there there. And so we centrifuge the sample, we spin it down, and we measure one by one, are there any sperm cells here? If there are none, we report back and say, there are no sperm cells found. If there are a couple sperm cells, if there are several, if there are 10, 100,000, we 
send out a follow-on kit to the patient free of charge because we want to make sure that the procedure was successful. If it is, it, if it is, uh, if there's still sperm found, we then send out a full semen analysis and we keep the physician and the clinic informed with every step of the way automatically so they know, okay, here's a patient here that's now on their second vasectomy test. It looks like there could be sperm found. Let's see whether the third test comes back with zero or whether we need to reach out to the patient. Okay, this is a fantastic way to increase uh, compliance for sure, post vasectomy. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that men have about uh, their fertility? Oh, that, 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 that's a good question. I think, I think a, a misconception that we have uh, gone after helping solve and provide information around is that I think when couples are trying to conceive, very often um, women take on the responsibility of the fertility uh, journey. And men can very often be like, oh, I, I'm providing a sample. Like there's a sample that I can generate. Therefore, yeah. It must be valid. It must be viable. <laughs> exactly, one hundred percent. And we know that. I mean, men don't really go to the doctor. They don't go to the doctor as often as women. I think a third of men don't have a, have a primary care physician. A quarter of men haven't been to the doctor in one year or longer. What what we have tried to empower men with is here's a very simple task that you can do from your home. You don't need to. You don't need to go in to generate the sample. You can do it from home and you can just learn what a baseline uh, semen analysis result could be on this fertility journey that you are on. And so one of the misconceptions is that men just presume that they're fine. Um, and that's something that is most often the case, but it, it is worth exploring both sides of the equation proactively when, when a couple is trying to conceive, that's for sure. Are there any signs or symptoms that men have um, that could alert them to potentially having fertility issues? That's a good question. Well, that there are other comorbidities. Um, so there have been some good good journal articles that have been published about how uh, semen quality is the canary in the coal mine to overall health. Um, in the earliest days of the business, um, I met with many uh, male reproductive health experts and just trying to learn what the market opportunity of this product was. And one physician said, well, guess what I ask patients as, as part of their, their onboarding form. I said, what, what do you ask? Um, I was like, do you ask BMI? He said, no, I don't ask BMI. I was like, interesting. Uh, what, would, what do you ask? I asked for waist size. And he said that obesity is really, is, is, uh, is, there is a relationship between obesity and, and subfertile outcomes. Um, and so that, that has been, been pretty interesting, but, uh, what do you think about, what do you think about, environmental factors like plastic and, and those types of things? Do you think, I, I don't know if you've listened to like Shana Swan and her, her studies or theories on, on that and how it's impacting male fertility. I, I, absolutely. So I've, I've, um, I've, I very much appreciate the work that Shana is doing to raise awareness of this and answer these questions. I mean, I was reading a, a, a Wall Street Journal article today on how um, cancer rates of young people have been increasing and physicians are trying to figure out why. I think that microplastics in the environment could be contributing to this trend, this, this, this decline in male fertility that we're seeing. Um, but the jury's still out on whether this is concrete um, I think processed foods, diet, lifestyle, I mean, the, we have uh, evolved from a habit and diet perspective pretty significantly over the last, I mean, 100 years alone, mm -hmm. over the next uh, 50, 100 years on how things that we're doing today are, uh, are negatively impacting our overall health. Um, I, mean, I, I filter all my tap water, for example. I think that's yeah. that's that's that's, 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 that's an easy one. one. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I just read a terrifying articles on Fox and CNN. All the nanoplastics mm -hmm. are starting to test the food, um, mm -hmm. and plant based being the worst because it's it's going through more more processing. But all these nanoparticles of plastic that they're finding mm -hmm. in our food. So I was curious. Uh, do you know of anybody, or have you looked at it? Are you going to try to test if you can find nanoplastics in sperm? That's a great question. 
so we we are uh, our patients uh, patients who, who do fellow tests uh, they're awesome and we ask them would you be interested in participating in research and we've had a good uh, good proportion of our patients say you know what I would be a, I would be willing to opt in here's some information about myself here's my exposure to organic foods here's my exposure to inorganic foods and things like that and we have built this research biorepository where we hope to be able to answer those questions over time okay. we're not currently pursuing that at the moment but that would definitely be a, a, a goal of ours for sure I was going to say you're collecting a lot of data and data is worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so you can test, you're going to be able to test all sorts of things probably and, and give us a lot of information on the, on the decline of, of sperm and maybe what you're seeing. And, um, you know, kind of, as you mentioned with the urologist that you talked to or the, your head of, of healthcare, how the, how the mm -hmm. sperm, um, can tell you so much more about the person. Are you kind of looking at that into the future for potentially like, uh, like what are you seeing there maybe for the future of fellow and what you're going to be able to tell? That's Health a good question. Um, so I think that the male reproductive system is, uh, is, is an area with a lot of challenge over time uh, it's it's like the prostate cancer testicular cancer bph infertility they all affect the male reproductive yeah. system and we believe that a semen sample is to this point about being the canary in the coal mine to overall health it is certainly the canary in the coal mine to male reproductive health and so could a semen sample have biomarkers in it that are associated with prostate cancer for example with testicular cancer with potentially BPH. Um, I think that those, those questions today seem to have gone unanswered. And I think we are in a good position to be able to help answer them um, for patients and for physicians to be able to take the sample and say, you know what, like we have learned this or we are learning that. And so that, that's, that's something that we're actively investing in at the moment. And two, um, just to build on that, a third of couples who struggle to conceive are idiopathic. So after a comprehensive workup, the outcome is that there is no explanation today for why this couple is struggling to conceive. At the American Society of Reproductive Medicine conference each year, there's um, uh, Dory Lamb has presented, she's, she's a, 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 the, the vice chair of urology at, at Cornell. Um, she has presented fascinating research on how taking a multi-omic approach to a semen analysis, to a semen sample, can, could help answer this question for patients, for especially this one third of patients. And so I think there's a lot more that we can learn about the sample. And today, it's been so stigmatized that like men don't generate these samples they don't send them in but one thing that we found is that men are happy to generate samples and send them in for a better understanding their health what percentage of your guys are then preserving their sample and maybe explain well, that process a little bit that's a good question so the full semen analysis that we do when we measure those five metrics count concentration volume morphology and motility we have the ability to then store the sample and cryopreserve it Without so them having have... to send another sample, right? Like if, if they exactly. send it in yeah. and decide later that they want to do it, you still can? Or what's the time frame there? Within kit registration, when they're about to send in the sample, they can say, you know what? I want to store this. Okay. They can also buy a dedicated cryo kit if their intention is to store from the very beginning. And okay. the opt-ins that we see, I mean, they fluctuate on a, on, on a monthly basis but we see 5%, 10% opt-in of men just saying, you know what, why, why not? I'd, I'd be happy to pay the $140 to store for the year. Um, we've also seen uh, many patients who, let's say a patient um, is about to undergo chemotherapy, for example. Sometimes they don't have the ability to go in person to a sperm bank to generate a sample because their chemotherapy needs to begin much sooner than they are able to do that. And in those scenarios, we've also found uh, a use case where we can support those patients who otherwise would not have been able to store a sample. So how is the preserving semen different than like if a female wanted to preserve 
her eggs? Like, is that, like, are you going through and finding like the strongest sperm here? Or you're just freezing the whole sample after you, after you we're, test it. How does this work? We're, free, we're freezing as many of the sperm cells as we can okay. find. That's, uh, that, that's our goal. Okay. And you said it's $140 a month? Yeah. $140 a year. A year. $140 oh, a, a year. year. For the yeah. whole year, it's $140. For the whole year. Yes. That's a great deal. That seems like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think you can really go wrong there. Wow. Uh, what mm -hmm. about for the full semen analysis? How much is, is it to do that? $189. Okay. That's also a good price. How, did you have competitors in the market whenever you uh, started this company? And then do you have them now that people have seen what you're doing and want to jump in? Um, we have seen a couple companies crop up in across the world, for example, like we've seen there's a small, small, I think, seed company that's trying to do a male and semen analysis in the UK, in, um, in Australia, I believe. And there are a couple in the US that are focused on storing sperm for men. Um, we are focused on what can we learn from the sample to provide back to the patients and we can store it for them if they want. Um, but we've seen a relatively uh, greenfield market environment for us at the moment. Okay. So what's your biggest concern um, whenever it comes to this space and male fertility? Like, is there, is there something that keeps you up at night or is there something internally that you guys are constantly talking about when it comes to, to this specialty in medicine? That's, that, that's a good question. One thing that we're talking a lot about is what can we do from a molecular standpoint? What biomarkers are in a semen sample that nobody knows about? Um, and so working with our clinic customers to enroll patients who are coming in for maybe different conversations that are not fertility related to provide a semen sample. That's something that we are interested in exploring. Um, and from a concern standpoint, I think I've, I've heard the, the saying as startups grow that as you double in size, you like, you can see challenges as you, every time you double yeah. in size, you, you see, you see challenges. And it's important for us to grow diligently and responsibly and innovate with purpose. And so as we go from 30 samples a day, which is where we were a couple of years ago to these 300 plus samples a day to let's say 600 plus samples a day, we need to make sure that we have the quality controls and the uh, processes in place to enable that continued scale and continued high quality. So on the contrary, what are you most excited about for your company here in the future? I, um, I think we've built a really great platform that um, can support clinics, that can support patients with our semen analysis, with our vasectomy kit, with our cryopreservation kit. I think what we can do from that is fascinating with regards to answering this question about one third of couples struggling to conceive, for example. Um, can we help solve that for patients and physicians? Can we take, can we perform next generation sequencing on this sample to identify biomarkers that could correspond with subfertility, with superfertility, with things like that? Like that is, I think, the next frontier of, uh, of, of, of medicine in this space, um, going into the multi-omic realm, so to speak. And that is an area of active research that we're exploring at the moment. Okay. Well, I think what you're doing is fascinating. So kind of just one last question for you, just because I'm always curious with business stuff. Is there any podcast that you listen to or books that you're reading, uh, whether it's in the healthcare space or the entrepreneurial space um, that you would like to share? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, let me just pull up my, uh, my, um, my Spotify. Um, <laughs> Cause so I'm like, a, I'm a junkie moment. when it comes to this stuff. So I'm constantly I'm always looking for more to learn, read, because I go through it so quick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I've been I've been listening a lot to uh, recently. Peter Atiyah's podcast has been pretty oh. interesting. Yep. I was reading some on. Uh, I was listening to some on prostate cancer um, and how it's interpreted by urologists and physicians, and what the opportunity for early cancer multi detection is in in the future. There have been a couple episodes on that front. Um, on the biotech front, for those interested, um, the long run with Luke Timmerman and Biotech 2050, uh, uh, some areas, but that, those can get quite, uh, some of those episodes are a little bit too technical for, 
for me. Um, the Huberman Lab has been interesting. It was just a big deep dive into particular topics. I know they, they did a very long one on uh, male fertility recently. Um, and what else? Um, yeah, that's, those, are, those are the main ones relevant to the, relevant I had, to the space. I had sure. the uh, the medical director for that Grail cancer screening on the show mm-hmm. a few months ago. I listened so to that, that episode. That... Oh, you did? Okay, yeah, he's yes. he's a nice he's a nice guy. And then mm-hmm. I also thought um, uh, there's a there's a Dr. Anthony J. You might like him. He wrote a book called Estro Generation, and he mm. talks a lot about male fertility um, and its exposure to plastic. He used to be a uh, uh, chemist at um the mayo clinic so Mm -hmm. and he he talks about some of the stuff that they that they discovered there and i had him on uh, my podcast early on but his book is called estro generation i think it's also fascinating for this topic well um you've managed to make um sperm analysis sexy i think your website's great your your results are slick um it it's it's really game changer and we really appreciate it and it's making our life significantly easier in the clinic and I know our, our patients like it and, and appreciate it. So it's it's game changing. So I appreciate what you're doing and I appreciate your time. Do you have anything else that you want to say? Just a, a, a quick thank you, Amy. I really appreciate the invite. And um, I mean, we wouldn't be where we were today without the support of clinics like Victory Men's Health and your patients. And so that's that's what uh, what keeps us going, what excites us as a whole team in terms of who can we support, how can we continue supporting them, and how can we create wonderful uh, clinician and patient experiences. So thank you for your partnership, and thank you for inviting me on today. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. And as always, I'll attach all this information in the show notes so people can find it easily. I also will uh, put some of these clips on YouTube if you want to see us do this podcast um, in person. And everybody have a great day. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks, Amy.